Well, good morning. All right, I got a question for you. You got to participate with me here. I need a show of hands. How many of you have watched or are in the process of watching season three of Stranger Things? Right here, all right. Are you serious? I thought there would be way more. This joke is totally going to die, all right. Uh, okay, so for those of you that put your hand up, like the three of you, um, <clears throat> My question for you is this, of those that put their hand up, how many of you actually went to high school in the 80s and early 90s? Oh, there's, okay, look at that, all right, all right, we're tracking. Now, I don't know what your experience is with, uh, as you watch Stranger Things, but my experience with that show is like, it is like totally deja vu. Like, I literally feel like I am watching my entire high school life, you know, be played out in front of me. Yeah, minus the mind flare, all right? I just got to throw that in there. Minus the mind flare, but I feel like I'm watching my entire high school life played out in that show. You know, like, when they show the, um, the pictures of, of, the, uh, of the lifeguards at the pool, and I see them in the red trunks, I'm like, that's me, man. I wore those shorts every summer when I was a lifeguard at the outdoor pool. I wore those trunks. Those were the ones I wore. You know, uh, the show features a, a newly opened mall. Like, I worked my entire high school life. I worked at Foot Locker in a newly opened mall. And so now, when I see the shoes that the characters on the show are wearing, I can, like, name them. I can tell you the price. Like, 11, she wears Reebok Prince's high tops. They cost 70 bucks, all right? I can, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. And then, you know, the other thing that, uh, that, I, that you know, takes me back to high school in that show is, is the hair. All right, it's the hair. Like, like check out Steve, you know, one of the, one of the main characters in uh, Stranger Things. Look at that. That's beautiful. <laughs> you know, like when I was in high school, it was all about business up front, party in the back, baby. And here it is. That's what I'm talking about. My kids, we were talking about, uh, you know, awkward stages that people go through. And when they looked at this picture, they were like, Dad, that's definitely your awkward stage. I'm like, what, my whole high school life you're telling me was awkward? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you got to look close at that picture because, like, I am, a, like, the real Canadian boy in that. Like, if you look at my smile, I'm actually missing half a tooth in that <laughs> I got hit in the mouth with a hockey stick, snapped, the tooth broke off. And, you know, I loved, you know, the fact that, you know, I'd be playing hockey and, you know, you have the helmet on and the hair just like kind of flows out behind you as you're skating around the ice. It gets full of sweat. You pull off that helmet and you do one of these. <laughs> oh, man, it takes me back. It takes me back. I love it. I love it. But, you know, there was a guy's hair that actually topped the mullet list. I mean, he might even be the reason why the mullet went out of style. You know, because like nobody could pull off the mullet like this guy. So we just all gave up. We just cut it off and, and we didn't want to do it anymore. And this was U.S. tennis star Andre Agassi. Take a look at him. Okay? That's, that's, that's beautiful. I mean, like, we all look pretty good up there together. It's like we're some kind of hair bro mullet you know, guys there. But uh, yeah, anyway, Andre Agassi was known for his neon outfits in the 80s and 90s and his, uh, and his exceptional hair, both of which were featured on a commercial for a camera called the Canon Rebel. And this commercial featured scenes of Agassi hitting otherworldly tennis shots and finishes with him taking off his shirt and throwing it at the camera as he repeats the tagline for the, the, the camera, because image is everything. Image is everything. You know, who would have known that Canon would have captured so succinctly one of the main themes of the book of James? Image is everything. You know, for James, image is everything. And not in the shallow, carefully curated, externally focused way expressed in the Canon commercial. For James, he means it in a more communal sense, as defining the collective identity of God's people. We are made in the image of God. You know, James believes that God's people, as God's people, we reflect his image. We reflect this relational complexity of divine love that is God to the world. And if you've been here when we've talked about the larger biblical story, 
you know that when we talk about the image of God, it's a hyperlink back to the creation story found in Genesis 1. When God creates a relational complexity, when he creates humanity, man and woman, in his image. You know, it's this larger biblical story that shapes the way James thinks about God and his people. And he tips his hand to this as he opens his letter in James chapter 1, verse 1, where he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. To the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. You know, this phrase, the 12 tribes, it is loaded with meaning. In fact, when James uses it, he is taking us all the way back to the beginnings of Israel. When Israel started with this man named Abraham who God had called out. And uh, we find in Genesis chapter 1, or chapter 12, sorry, verses 1 to 3, God is speaking to Abraham and he says to Abraham, he says, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you. And make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who curse you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You see this was the calling of the people of Israel. This is what came, was passed on to them through Abraham as eventually these 12 tribes formed into a nation. That they were supposed to be this people who went out into the world and they brought God's blessing into the world. They brought God's blessings to the nations. But we know as we understand the story of scripture that Israel failed miserably at that. They failed to be the people that God had created and called them to be. They failed to be people who reflected his image to the world and brought his blessings there. And so eventually they were carried off into exile. But before that happened, God had made a promise to one of their kings, a king named David. And he said to David, he said, you know what, David, someday there is going to be a forever king that rules on your throne. And I will restore the people of Israel to who they were called and created to be. I will restore them to this people from uh, from where my blessing will come out and go out from there into the world. And this is where we see James picking up this theme. In Acts chapter 15, verses 16 to 18, and what's happening in this passage of scripture is that James is quoting from the prophet Amos as he's writing a letter to the churches on how to embrace and accept the nations, these Gentile believers that are now coming in to these new communities, that are coming into communities that, that um, have pledged their allegiance to following Jesus. And so listen to what, what, uh, what uh, James quotes from the prophet Amos. He says, and with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as, is, just as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it. That the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who, make these th- who makes these things known from old. You see, this is why in James chapter 1, verse 18, where Kevin left us last week, he refers to this community as the first fruits. These, this new community as the first fruits. You see, they, they are the first fruits of God's new creation who reflect his image and bring his blessing into the world. And James, in his letter, is so concerned that these new communities of believers, these newly formed people of God, he's concerned that they understand and live according to their collective identity as his people. His collective identity who reflects his image and brings his blessing into the world. You know, so the practical everyday wisdom that James gives us in this letter is not about making faith relevant to us, but rather moving us towards living lives that are relevant to God and his mission. James is about moving us towards living lives that are relevant to God and his mission. So, 
If you have your Bibles, you can, take them, uh, you can take them with me. If you don't have a Bible, a physical copy, there's some in the seat backs in front of you. And uh, we're going to read James chapter 1, verses 19 to 27. You can find it on your device as well. But if you don't have any of those, good news. It's going to be up on the screen behind me as I read it. So James chapter 1, 19 to 27. Let's read this. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious... And does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction. And to keep oneself unstained from the world. You know, James doesn't really pull any punches in this thing. He just kind of jumps right into it. And so we're going to do that right now. Like we've already said, is that what James is really concerned about is that we live lives that are relevant to God and his mission. And so right off the hop in James chapter 1, verses 19 to 22, what James is trying to get across to his, his readers and his hearers here is that we need to realize our identity. We need to realize who we are, who God has made us to be. And so he starts off with this. He's like, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So like the opposite of Twitter, all right? For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. You know, being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry, it's great advice for all of our personal, or all of our interpersonal relationships. You know, I just had this conversation about being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry with my kids the other day. And I don't know what it's like in your house, but in my house, sometimes things go from zero to volcano super fast. You know, like, my son will open up the, the uh, oh, sorry, he's back there doing lights. Hey, Sam. <laughs> my son will open up the fridge door, and all of a sudden, who put the empty bag of milk back in the fridge? You know, they'll get to the toilet paper. Oh, where, where's the toilet paper? How come it's not changed? Or why are you wearing my socks? You know, all these things. We just go from zero to volcano, and it totally causes a dis- disruption in my home. You know, But James just isn't giving us good interpersonal advice here. What he is really concerned with is the effects of our anger. Because what he says here is that our anger does not produce God's righteousness. Now, I know that when we come to this word righteousness, a lot of us will understand it this way, that what, what James is talking about here is like our right standing before God or God's righteousness that he gives to us as we come to him uh, through Jesus. But James actually has a different understanding of righteousness than what I've just described to you. And it's found in this word that he uses to actually define God's righteousness. It's a Greek word, and if you are a Greek scholar or uh, you know speak Greek, I'm I'm going to just apologize right off the hop. My Greek is terrible, and uh, I'm going to try to pronounce this, but, you know, whatever. But the word is this. It's dikaionise. Dikaionise. All right? And what this word means is this. It actually refers to God's justice. 
All right, so when we talk about, when, when the, the, our scriptures talk about the righteousness that comes into the world, they're talking about God's righteousness, God's justice, when he comes and makes everything all anew again. And so what James is saying here is that our anger does not brings, bring God's justice into the world. It actually brings the opposite. Think about that for a second. If our anger does not produce God's justice in the world, what does it produce? What does it produce? You know, I can tell you this for sure, that it hinders us from realizing our identity as God's people and becoming the people that he has created us to become. You know, there's so many avenues that we could go down in terms of Uh, applying this uh, passage to our lives and and our anger, but I I just want to jump off for a little bit on on social media because I learned something this week from my kids. I learned about this phrase, being put on blast. Is anybody familiar with that phrase, being put on blast? Yeah, some some are shaking their heads, like anybody under 25. You look 25 to me. Uh, (laughs) um, Is actually, uh, you know, kind of gets it. But here, so when, when my daughter talked to me about being put on blast, you know, what, what uh, I said, oh yeah, I, I understand being put on blast. It's like, you put someone on blast because I'm a product of the 90s. It's like, you send out this big email to people, right? And you're, you, you tell them, hey, congratulations, you're ha- we're having a baby. No, we're not. But, you know, that's just, we're, you guys are a tough crowd today, man. Um, <laughs> Yeah, or being put on blast is like you're telling, somebody good, you're telling somebody good news, some of the things that are happening in your life. But the reality is, is that my daughter says, no, no, dad, no, that's not what we mean here. When you put someone on blast, like you like call them out. Like call them out on social media, on Instagram, or whatever it is. And your whole purpose in putting someone on blast is to totally humiliate them. To like pull the rug out from underneath them, to embarrass them, not just in front of their followers, but of your followers, and it, gets, it goes all over the, the internet. That's the whole purpose of it. You know, when we respond like this, when we put people on blast, whether that's in social media or that's in real life, but specifically social media, we do nothing to disrupt the toxic culture of social media. When we put people on blast, we do nothing to to disrupt the toxic culture of social media. It doesn't do anything to redeem it, to bring life to it, to bring peace, to bring encouragement, to even bring civility to that culture. You know, we've applied it to social media, but when we think about putting people on blast in our own lives, what about when we put our kids on blast? or when we put the guy uh, at work on blast, or when we put the person that cut us off on the 401 on blast. You see, this is the one thing that I've become convinced of, is that I don't believe that there is a case to be made for righteous human anger. When people say, man, my anger, I'm just righteously angry, I just think that's a misnomer. I don't think that that's true At all. You see, what James is saying here is that whether our intention or not uh, is to, or whether whether it's our intention or not to actually um, uh, commit violence with our anger, whether that's the intended effect, it doesn't matter. If our anger produces violence, whether that's emotional, whether that's physical, whether that's spiritual, or whether that's mental, we have actually departed from following the way of Jesus in the world. We are not bringing the righteousness of God, the justice of God. And in a world that is becoming more and more polarized, we need to live in a new way. You know, this is such an opportunity for us as followers of Jesus. Because we're not about division. We're about reconciliation. We're about things coming, people coming together. We're about relationships being restored. We're about bringing... God's blessing into the world, we're about bringing in life and peace and love and hope and salvation and justice. That's what we're supposed to be about. It's not about putting people on blast. We're supposed to produce life and life abundantly in our world, not the vision. You know, so how do we do this? Well, James goes on to tell us it's by receiving the word 
the word that, the, the word that is implanted in us with meekness. Now, I can tell you this, that scholars are all over the map when it comes to this phrase, what does the implanted word actually mean? You know, some people believe that it's, it refers to the Torah. And what you need to understand, the Torah, it's like the Jewish law. What you need to know is that the time that James is writing this, and the time in the history of the early church, is this, is that there were a lot of followers of Jesus who were still involved with synagogue worship, who were still involved with Torah worship. And so, to understand the word implanted in them as the Torah itself, itself was not, was not a stretch. Other scholars will argue that it's actually God's word. It's this prophetic word. It's this word that has called them out into becoming this new community. That's what is meant by this phrase. Others will say it's actually the gospel, the good news about Jesus, while others say it's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that has been implanted in us. The point is this, is that as the first fruits of a new creation, God has implanted his word in you, however you understand it, to transform you. This is actually the commonality between all the perspectives on the implanted word. Whether it is the Torah, the prophetic word of God, the gospel, or the Holy Spirit, all of these contribute to our transformation into the people of God and realizing our identity. But James puts a condition on receiving this implanted word. We are supposed to receive this word with meekness. Meaning, we need to be willing to be teachable, humble, willing to submit to the process, as Paul puts it, being conformed or made into the image of Jesus. You know, this is a process that we can't do on our own. We need people to help us do that. And so I would just ask you, Who are the people in your lives that help you take this implanted word and live it out? Who are the people that you have that surround you, that help you understand the word and and, and help you become conformed to the image of Jesus? Who are they? Think about who they could be. You know, as we keep going through this passage, so James wants us to realize our identity, but he, he says this about the people that, that he's uh, writing to here. He wants them to remember who they are. He wants them to remember their identity. And so in James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, he says this, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away at once and forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in all his doing. How many of you guys have ever been to a synagogue? Hands up. A few, a few of you. All right, so what you need to understand in, in this, if you've been to a synagogue, you understand what James is saying, be hearers of the word, or not just hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. Because what would happen in a synagogue, when I lived in Montreal, I got invited by a bunch of rabbis to come into their synagogue and to, they gave me a tour, we ate lunch together, and all this stuff, it was really cool. And when I got in there and they showed me their platform, what they showed me at the back was this, this, this uh, big structure where they kept the scrolls. All right, where they kept the scrolls. And so what would happen every uh, Saturday when they, when they celebrate, or every Sabbath when they celebrated together as a community, they would bring out these scrolls and they would put them on the lectern. And then the guy that was reading the scriptures would actually take out, uh, take this little pointer and he would go along and he would read the word for that day. And so people would hear the scriptures read to them. And if you've never heard the scriptures read in Hebrew, it's like amazing. Because there's this cadence and rhythm to it. It literally sounds like a song. And so that's what, the, that's what James is, is envisioning when he, when he hears, uh, when, he, when he writes this. But I kind of think that if James was writing to us today, that verse would read something um, more like this. He might rephrase it to, be, to say this, to be doers of the word and not readers or studiers. Be doers of the word and not just readers or studiers. You see, for James, what he's concerned about is the hearing or the, doing, or the, the hearing and the studying and the, and the reading, that those things remain connected to the doing. 
They can't be separated. I was just on a webinar a couple weeks ago with a pastor who has actually been influential in my life, and uh, he was talking about when he started at this new church, a church that he was so excited to go to because they were a Bible-preaching church. You know, they, were, they, they loved God's Word, and they had all these groups that were set up around. They were committed to studying God's Word and all this kind of stuff, so he was really excited to show up. And he shows up and he begins to go to all the groups that are studying God's word and he's asking them what they're studying and all this kind of stuff. They're able to actually tell him all the things they've studied. You know, all the books of the Bible they've studied, all the, all the authors they've looked at, all this kind of stuff. And after he hears all of this from them, he asks them one question. And his question was this, so what have you done with all that you've learned? What have you done with all that you've learned? And his response was total silence. They couldn't tell him what they'd done with what they had learned. And so he took this radical step and he said to these groups, he said, okay, here's the deal, guys. I don't want you to study your Bible now for three to six months. You cannot start another Bible study. You cannot start another book of the Bible. I don't want you doing that for the next three to, three to six months. What I want you to do with your community now is I want you to get together and I want you to talk about the things that you've learned and I want you to come up with a plan and get back to me and tell me how you're going to live these things out, how you're actually going to do them. You know, I, I got a friend here at our church. His name's uh, Graham Legine. All right, at least I, I would say he's a friend. I, I think he would call me that too. He hasn't invited me to his cottage yet, so I mean, I don't know where that, where that puts us in that defining the friendship um, thing. But, uh, you know, anyway, um, <clears throat> Graham, I, I love Graham, and Graham and I were having a, a conversation one time. After he's, he actually helps me out with Alpha. He's an elder here too, uh, and he's just an, uh, an awesome guy. He was having this conversation with me after Alpha, and he was telling me about how he'd been in all these Bible studies here at, at Bayview Glen, and, and if you know Graham, this is going to be funny. If you don't know Graham, you just think I'm crazy, but he's like, you know, Pastor Dave, you know, um, I, I was a part of all these Bible studies, and, uh, and they were great, you know, like, but, but there was a, a point in my life where I just, I was like, I just had to do something, you know? I just wanted to do something. So, like, I want to start, like, what if we stopped doing Bible studies and we started, like, Bible do groups, you know, where we, where we just, you know, did the Bible, where we read it and then we did it. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. You know, sign me up for that. I think I could get, I think I could get behind that. You see, and James picks up on this, this, this being doers of the word uh, in, in, uh, in another way as well. In fact, he says that if you aren't one that, that does the word or do what the word says, if you are only a hearer or a reader or a studier, that there's some pretty dire consequences for you here. And so uh, this phrase that in, in verse uh, 24, this phrase, or sorry, 23, where he says, he looks intently at his natural face. All right, in, in Greek, um, what it's actually referring to, and here, here again, my apologies to uh, Greek scholars, but the phrase is this, it's prosoponte gena, genaso, genesiosis, all right? All right, and so prosopon means face. Genesiosis, if you look at it coming up here, um, you can see that the, there's the root in there is genesis, so it, it actually refers to your birth or coming into existence. And so what James is saying here about the one who listens to the word and doesn't do it. He's like, he's like a man who looks at himself in the mirror. He looks at his face in the mirror and then walks away and totally forgets the reason why he exists. That's what James is actually saying here. That if we read the word and we don't put it into practice, that we totally forget why we exist. We forget the purpose for which God created us. We forget the fact that we are supposed to be these people made in the image of God to reflect his love and bring his blessing into the world. That's what James is saying, is that if you read the word and you don't do anything about it, you become this person who totally misunderstands or forgets about their purpose and why they're actually here. You know, this gets picked up by a rabbi, actually, uh, Rabbi Simeon ben Gamaliel, and he's a contemporary of James, and he wrote this, he's not, it's, he wrote, and this is weird English, so excuse me, he's like, not the learning is the main things, but the doing. Not the learning is the main things, but the doing. 
See, James is tracking with these rabbis where they're saying, if you are not putting the word into practice, if you are not doing it, you're missing the point. Totally. Now, I don't know what your guys' practice is when it comes to reading the word, um, when it comes to studying it, but in, in my own, like we have this, uh, this disciple-making practice that we've been moving towards introducing in our congregation. It's, about, it's called dedicating ourselves to God's word and prayer. We want to be a church that practices that as we become more like Jesus. We want to dedicate ourselves to God's word and prayer. And so as I'm going about dedicating myself to God's word, as I'm having my times where I'm reflecting on the scripture, I will often end my time after reading a passage of scripture and just kind of rest and meditate for a moment and ask God this question. God, what is it that you want me to do with what you've given me today? What is it that you want me to do with what you've given me today? And I can tell you this, because I've been meditating on this passage of scripture all week. <laughs> the stuff that God has been asking me to do as a result of this, it's like, it's blowing my mind. It's blowing my mind. You see, James wants us to remember our identity. And the way that we remember our identity is like by putting into practice what we learn, what we read in the scriptures. But if we keep on working through this passage, uh, we come to James chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. And what James is asking his community to do in James 26 and 27 is this. He's asking them to reimagine how they live out their identity. Reimagining how, uh, reimagining living out their identity. So it says this in James 26 to 27. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his heart. So that's just a, a rehash of verse 19 about quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. He's just saying it in a different way. This person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. To visit widows and orphans in their affliction and keep oneself unstained from the world. You know, that, that phrase, widows and orphans, actually James uses that on many levels, on a, on a few levels in this passage of scripture. And the first level is this, is that we need to understand what it means to be a widow and an orphan. You see, in first century Israel, and, and even previous to that, in order to be considered an orphan, only one of your parents had to pass away. Only one of your parents had to die, and you were considered an orphan. And so that's why widows and orphans are always linked together because if the husband died or the, the husband and father died, his wife was considered a widow and his kids were considered orphans. And so it is part of the Old Testament law that they were supposed to, that, uh, that, that the people of Israel were supposed to look after with their widows and orphans because if they didn't, they had no way to make, uh, make gainful employment. They had no way to actually look after themselves. They needed to rely on the community. So James wants us to understand that, but he also uses this passage of scripture or this phrase to point his community to something else. You see, because widows and orphans, the phrase widows and orphans actually became synonymous for a larger group of people. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 17, it says this, you shall not pervert the justice due to the sojourner, all right, so the traveler or the foreigner, or to the fatherless, or take a widow's, ple or take a widow's garment in pledge. You see, this, this phrase Orphans and widows actually became synonymous, like I said, for the marginalized, for the larger group, for the foreigner, the alien, the poor. But James is also thinking on another level when he writes this verse to his readers. And that is this. Widows and orphans, that was James's neighborhood. Those were the people in his neighborhood you know, we understand from the book of Acts that the church of Jerusalem struggled financially. We also understand in Acts chapter 6 that the church in Jerusalem had this large contingent of widows that they actually provided food for. So when James writes this passage of scripture, 
Oh, sorry, I, we also know that within a few years of writing this letter, that Paul is about to go out on a missionary journey with the sole purpose of collecting money to bring back to that church so that they can continue to support the widow and orphan and those in their community. You see, James is asking his readers to reimagine how they live out their identity as God's people. What he's saying is the mark of someone who practices true religion, the mark of someone who practices true religion is one that demonstrates a compassion to the least of these. You know, when I was a high school teacher in northern BC at a Christian school, one of the things that we did every uh, fall was we took our grade 11s, our grade 11 classes on a trip down to Vancouver. And the whole purpose of our trip down to Vancouver was to actually join an organization called YWAM to help them serve the urban poor that were in, in that city. Now, I don't know how familiar, familiar you are with Vancouver, but it's an incredible city. Um, there's a neighborhood where you can find, obviously, multi-million dollar homes, and literally across the street, it's just lined up with homeless people. It's this, the Lower East Side. You might have heard, it's in the news a lot for a lot of unsavory uh, reasons. And so that's where I took these kids. We would go down to, this, to the Lower East Side, and we would join this organization, and we would sit amongst the urban poor. And uh, one of the things that we had to do is actually serve at a soup kitchen, and uh, so uh, as, as uh, our group shows up, the uh, leader of the, of the soup kitchen, he finds out that I'm a teacher and that I was a pastor and all this kind of stuff. He's like, awesome. I would love you to speak to our people. And I'm like, I mean, I get nervous in front of you guys. I mean, can you imagine? I'm in front of a, peop- in front of a group of people that I don't know and a group of people that I know have been marginalized and rejected, have been treated like garbage. And here I'm asked as somebody from the other side to speak a word to them. I'm like, what do I have to say? What could I possibly have to say to this group of people that would connect with them? So it's literally five minutes before I have to go up to talk and I have no idea what I'm gonna say. I walk up there, And I just look over the crowd, and I said the only thing that I could say, and that was thank you. I said thank you to them. You see, because what had happened the day before was that one of our tasks was to actually go down and share our lunch with somebody, and uh, 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 somebody from the homeless community, and to sit with them and to find out their story, and and like I said, share a lunch with them. And a couple students from our group, they actually got cut off from the rest of us. And in order to catch up, they they went to take this shortcut down this alley. And as they're about to step into the alley, there's a group of people from this homeless community, and they stopped them. And they said, whoa, 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 whoa. You guys don't want to go down there. And my students were like, well, we got to catch up. No, 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 you don't want to go down there. (laughs) That's great. He's imitating me. (laughs) Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh. <laughs> anyway, he, uh, they had said, no, you don't want to go down there. And our students were trying to understand, you know, why, why that was. And so as they kind of backed up and they surveyed the alley, what they saw happening was there was drug deals going down and there was a bunch of other stuff that was happening. And so they turned around and they walked away. And so all I could say when I stood up in front of these people, I said, thank you so much for looking after and loving my kids like I love them. Because I know this. There's one thing that I know is true. Is that where love is, God is. Where love is, God is. And so I just said, I just said thank you. And after I was done speaking, we had the opportunity just to sit and to talk to the people from that community. And what I discovered was this is that I discovered that every story that I heard started in a neighborhood. I discovered that to find the marginalized, the widow, the orphan, the alien, the new immigrant, I didn't have to go to a soup kitchen or a homeless shelter. They were all in my neighborhood, literally in my neighborhood. You see, there's a widow that lives across the street from me. 
There's members from the LGBTQ community right next door. Around the corner, there's some newly immigrated families. They're right there. And I would put money on it that your neighborhoods are the exact same way. And so my wife and I are reimagining what it looks like to live as God's people. To bring his blessing to those who are in our neighborhood. But I got a question for you. Do you ever wonder how many neighborhoods are represented in our church? Think about that. Over a thousand people here. How many neighborhoods are represented in our church? I think about it all the time. All the time. And then I start to wonder, what if we all reimagined how we live out our identity as God's people and turned our attention towards those that are in our neighborhood? What would change? How would our neighborhoods change? How would our city change? How would the perception of followers of Jesus change? I think about that all the time. So, because I don't get to preach very often, uh, I still have two uh, pages of sermon to go through. But this little clock at the back is telling me that I'm done. So I'm going to stop there, because it's nice out, right? It's nice outside. So I'm going to stop there and, uh, and, and kind of end things. But this is the whole thing. Remembering, or sorry, realizing our identity, remembering our identity, and reimagining how we live out our identity. These are the, the things that James is talking to his community about, and therefore talking to us about how we make our lives relevant to God and his mission. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this word that you've given us. Um, I thank you so much for the scriptures, and I thank you so much for your work in the life of James, and that he wrote down these things for us that are so challenging, but at the same time so exciting when we think about the possibilities. And so God, I just ask that as we think about this week, how we can be more about doing what you say rather than just letting the things that we learn or the things that we study sit with us. God, I pray that you would challenge us, that you would move us into new ways and new directions. I pray that we would take risks this week as we seek to live as your people in the world, the people who reflect your image, who bring your life and your blessing and your love to our city, our neighborhoods, and those that we work with. God, I pray these things in your name. Amen.